Uh, back in 1984, Carnegie Mellon was outside with the interrogator robot and driving around and uh, cleaning up nuclear accidents and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, back in the day, uh, Jim was uh, brand new at Ford. And uh, I actually first met him uh, as a competitor racing the chapters. And so we'll have a little sidebar about how that turned out later. But, uh, the reality is uh, the, the race never goes to the quick. It doesn't. And uh, now times change and uh, the big guys are in the game. Um, here's the story from Ford. Wow, thank you for the introduction, Red. Um, so I have to confess, uh, I was out of town on a last minute business trip, one of those kinds where the chief technical officer says, can you be somewhere on a plane in an hour? And um, I had this charter to come here and to talk about three things, um, sort of what Ford's doing in autonomy historically and now, uh, given that this is the 10 year of the DARPA challenge, throw in a few slides, uh, you know, giving you an image of what things looked like back then, and a bit of recruiting because, you know, I come here once or twice a year to say, hey, you know, uh, we like your school, uh, you know, we like your students, uh, you know, come hang out with us and do some projects. So, what I did last night when I got home at midnight from San Francisco is I went to the closet and I looked for the dozen or more laptops saying, you know, there's probably a good video on there from the DARPA challenge, but which one of the laptops and in which file folder? So if you'll bear with me, what I've done is I've just dragged a whole bunch of slides there. Some of them have words we don't need to read, but on those are some cool pictures and uh, some videos, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the context of DARPA Challenge, Ford, and recruiting. So um, let me just get started here. Uh, ever since my childhood and you know, Red's childhood, we've been promised that you know, we'd have this car that drives itself just right around the corner. And, I have to say Ford's partly guilty for that because the famous Batmobile came out of her own uh, design studio. And uh, the answer to this always seemed to be, you know, 10 years in the future and 10 years never ever came. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I joined Ford Motor Company, the state of the art in autonomous vehicle technology pretty much looked like this Dilbert cartoon from 1984. And uh, so what happened? So. How many of you guys would believe me if I told you I had half a billion dollars in my pocket? Oh, I got one taker on that, two takers, yeah. So in 1984, a megabyte of memory cost you about a thousand bucks, and I think I have two iPhones and a couple of thumb drives in my pocket, and I've probably got you know, at least a gigabyte of memory in my pocket, and that's worth you know, quite a bit of money in 1984. So what happened to change the story between 10 years is never going to seem to come, is there was a vast improvement in uh, computational power and remote sensing capability. And uh, that's uh, essentially why we went to the DARPA challenges. And I assume this is Carnegie Mellon, most of you guys know what the DARPA challenges is, but here's a slide where I usually explain to people. In 2001, Congress uh, had this mandate saying, you know, we'd like to remove people from the battlefield and it's just not happening fast enough. So why don't we get some people from academia, uh, industry, you know, some crackpots and, and get them all together in the desert and see if somebody can drive across this terrain and help kickstart this effort. So uh, there was a series of increasingly difficult challenges. I don't want you to read this slide. Um, this is sort of the history of it. But uh, basically the things you should take away from it here is that the winners of each of these events were uh, universities paired with some auto companies and that Ford uh, was one of six teams that uh, made it to both of the finals. So that's the Ford message here. Uh, we had a very small team, we, maybe a dozen people at most. Uh, we came to the game rather late. I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, there was a problem here. So if you went to any of the early briefings on the DARPA challenge, the guys from DARPA said, you know, you're going to drive through stuff like this. And so when I saw terrain like this and like this and like this, I thought, well, you know, if I go to this race and I fail, the failure mode cannot be a Ford pickup, right? So the failure mode has to be something other than that. So uh, we went to the race 
with the attitude that we really were going to drive across terrain like this. So we had, you'll see the picture here, I think it's, well, let me, let me back up. I don't want to show you that one yet. But you'll see the picture of our vehicle. We had uh, one of our larger Super Duty pickups, and it had an exoskeleton on it welded to the frame with skid plates, locking differentials, Kevlar tires, inner run flat liners. Um, you know, we had the computers with their own air conditioned unit, shock towers in a box. I mean, you know, we weren't going to break the platform itself. If we were going to fail, it was going to be the software. And uh, as it turns out, um, most of the course looked like that, and you could have got across it in a golf cart. So uh, uh, I think there were only three teams, perhaps, that took DARPA's goal seriously. One would be Red's team here, uh, Sandstorm and Highlander and such. Uh, our team had, ironically, the least maneuverable vehicle in the race. Now, you might call me crazy because you see Terramax, this vehicle that's you know, bigger than this room, but it had rear wheel steer. And in our case, our vehicle, if you turned a circle in the desert or a dry lake bed, was a 54 foot diameter. Now, our vehicle could go in reverse, and uh, it did, but in both the races, ultimately that 54 foot diameter cost us because of some of our own stupidity and the way the course was laid out. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But at the first challenge, I didn't actually participate. I only learned about it a few months in advance. And I volunteered to help DARPA stage the race. And so I went out there and one of my jobs was to go visit every team and read their technical papers and make sure they had some credibility and they weren't going to kill people out on the course. And uh, so I managed to meet everyone in the industry. And that was a real boon for me because now I know all these people that are the heads of all these self-driving car teams and such. But one of the things that struck me is a lot of the people that showed up missed the problem statement. Uh, the problem wasn't to invent a new vehicle, the problem was to put the brains in the vehicle. And so you saw all these entrants like this show up and uh, in the end they, they really didn't do so well. It was the wrong problem. Uh, and as I said, there uh, wasn't a lot of advance notice before this race. So unless you were a well-established robotics program or somebody that was working on this over, you know, for a long period of time, you only had a few months to uh, put together your machine and your software. So you saw a lot of things that were cobbled together and you know, just bolted in place here and there. And, and uh, since this time, we've seen a lot of refinement in what, uh, what platforms look like. Um, I only want to talk about a couple of these notable results. Uh, Sandstorm went the furthest at the first race, uh, a little over seven miles, and they got to the hard part of the course. Uh, that was something that DARPA hadn't really thought through too well. They put the hard part at the beginning. And uh, the shortest dif distance traveled was the motorcycle there, Ghost Rider. It made it four feet. <laughs> uh, Terramax was afraid of tumbleweeds and it would go forward and back and forward and back and forward and back and it logged over you know two tenths of a mile going backwards before they finally decided to call it quits. Um, I'd say one of the surprising teams there was Team Gollum. They actually passed uh, ten other people on the course and uh, the red team only knocked down two fence posts. They lost it to Seymour. Um, but what really happened at that event wasn't so much the cars, it was the worldwide media was there watching. It's kind of a double-edged sword uh, because on one hand, the best team in the world only made it seven miles and most of the rest of them were stranded at the finish line more or less. And so you had a bunch of people writing what a colossal failure this was. And uh, there was a lot of ridicule about it and on the other hand, it you know, really got everyone's attention that this was a problem and it had implications beyond just driving in the desert for the military and it really did kickstart the entire field of uh, ground robotics in the automotive industry as we know it. And uh, so DARPA rather rapidly said, you know, we better do this again and uh, you know, improve on the media coverage because media is everything and I work for a company and I know that. Um, so, at the second race, um, I decided that you know, I should show up and actually uh, not run the race, but be in the race. And so this was our vehicle. We called it the Desert Tortoise. We had two vehicles. They were identical, and we called one the Desert Hare. And we had this uh, crazy idea that 
we'd program one of them to be really aggressive and the other one to be not so aggressive and we'd decide on race day which one to race. And uh, um, one of the things that I want to talk a little bit about here is the sensing suite on here. And so at this date and time, there was nothing moving on the course aside from some desert tortoises, which we named the truck after. Um, so the way that people got around was largely to drive roads that were devoid of, uh, you know, any transient or moving obstacles. And so it made the problem a lot simpler. And uh, you'll see on this vehicle here, we, okay, that worked well. Uh, we, we had two really high precision airborne LIDARs. Uh, these things, uh, 0.2 degree per, per uh, shot of the laser. So really finely resolution, we could put two lines across the road. And if you put a cross section across the road, you could see the crown in the road, you could see the ditches, you could kind of infer where the middle of it was. Uh, so in between, whenever we'd get a GPS uh, waypoint fix, uh, this was a really convenient way to drive the road. We had a couple extra down here, had an array of radars in the front, some stereo cameras, you know, all the usual sort of suspects. But what you don't see here is you don't see any live imaging that would enable you to handle real-time dynamic moving objects. And that'll be the big difference between the desert race and the urban race. And there's a little bit of a backstory here in the, in the lasers as well. So uh, one of my favorite teams in the first Grand Challenge was a team uh, from Velodyne. It was two brothers. And they just showed up in their pickup truck not knowing that uh, the, the vehicle would get impounded at the race and they had no way to get to their hotel. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the owner of Velodyne, this guy Dave Hall, he's a really brilliant, uh, eccentric, genius uh, inventor, he had uh, one of the more creative stereo systems I ever saw. And if you recall, you know, I had to go around and do the technical analysis of each team and the safety uh, assessment. And I had lots of arguments with Dave about, you know, how he was going to improve his system. And in my background, I don't know if, this, if we mentioned this earlier, but I'm a, a physics guy. So, you know, as physics guys, we smash things together. And in my life, I smashed photons together. And so I uh, did a lot of work with lasers and optics. And so I said to Dave, you know, if I were going to come back to this race eventually, I'd just glue 100 lasers together and spin them around really fast. And um, that's, in fact, what Dave did. And uh, I worked with Dave over the years. And uh, he's created uh, all the products that you see on most everybody's car that's under development now, the Velodyne LiDAR systems. And uh, you'll see that on the, on the urban vehicles. The only one at the desert vehicle that had it was Dave, because uh, I told Dave to build it. Um, so why did we go to the DARPA challenge? Well, we didn't go there to build robots. Um, the premise that we had was, if you could go there and learn about the rapidly evolving sensing hardware and algorithms, you could probably take that knowledge back and make some better active safety features on mass production vehicles. And uh, we thought that was a noble effort. And we came away from the race, however, with the conclusion that, you know, the idea of a self-driving vehicle wasn't entirely crazy, that we could do it. And, you know, a lot of people also had that idea. And, and that's uh, where you've seen this proliferation of uh, autonomous vehicles. Now, I'll explain this top statement here in a second. Let's just leave this aside for the moment. But the obvious safety reason that I just stated is borne out by the fact that over a million people worldwide die in automotive accidents every year. And the vast majority of them, certainly in the 90 some percent percentage range, are human induced. So there's a huge opportunity here for taking these technologies and improving safety. And so from our point of view, safety was always the first, uh, first goal of the mission. And it wasn't until later on that we just discovered all these ancillary benefits like uh, you know, added uh, mobility for uh, disabled and elderly and young people and uh, uh, you know, freeing up some of your time in the car and ride sharing and conserving fuel and you know, all the other things that you see in the media every day talked about. But uh, initially it was all about safety. And if, if you look at the accident statistics in the United States, about 35, 40,000 people a year die in a car crash. That's the equivalent of one of these a day. If that happened once a day in the United States, you'd have everyone up in arms. But somehow we seem to tolerate these car crashes. So anyway, we went to the DARPA challenge and we uh, did in fact drive our truck on roads that looked like what you know, DARPA scared us with. Uh, some pretty rough stuff was our test terrain. Um, 
we had a small crew, like I said, this was our, you know, this was our flotilla of uh, uh, support and a uh, couple of highlights of the race, uh, we drove 50 miles an hour during qualifying. Uh, out on the course, we were the, I think we were the first bot to ever pass somebody. We were driving 50 miles an hour there on that dry lake bed when we passed Team Axion. But uh, we had a low point here. Um, we uh, ended our race day right here when this military photographer stepped out into the road uh, when we had to make a turn. And I'll show you in a little more detail where that was at. We were actually driving down this road here, doing exactly what I was telling you, using the cameras and the laser scanner to identify what the road was. And the way our computer architecture worked at that time, we had a bunch of different sensors coming in and the sensors kind of got some voting scheme about saying who thought you know, they had the right to have the correct answer. And uh, there was actually a GPS coordinate, so I guess my laser's given out, there's a GPS coordinate down this road here. This road was only a foot wider than our truck and it was at about a 110 degree angle. Remember I said it took 54 feet for us to turn that truck around. We had literally zero margin for error to make that corner. So we had this voting scheme going on. The cameras and the lasers say go straight down this big road. The GPS says maybe you should make a left-hand turn. So eventually we get to this point, we start to make a left-hand turn and we see this photographer standing where this guy here is in the road. Picked him up as an obstacle and we said, well, obstacle and road, turn right. So we went left, right, left. It ended up in us going uh, just about two feet to the right of the road and we got behind a wall of bushes just like you see here and there was just this infinite wall of bushes for the next few miles and you know we could never get back to the road so that was the end of our race day uh, we eventually dropped a hard drive in the in the in the vehicle uh, as I said you know LiDAR came to this race and so this is the first Velodyne sensor that Dave built uh, you know based on me nagging him to do it uh, this is what the output looked like then wasn't as crisp and clear as today, but it still did the job. Now some other people had ideas about how to do multiple LiDAR beams. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this one, but these guys did pretty good in the race. In fact, they finished first. So fast forward to the Urban Challenge and take all the desert stuff that we just showed you and add to it a closed Air Force base that sort of looks like a city that's been bombed with uh, you know, a few airstrikes. So the streets looked like this, fairly barren except when other vehicles were on them, and they did put other vehicles on them. Um, and then they put some network through the city and you had to you know, randomly connect the dots and figure out how to do that. Again, don't read the words here. Uh, our truck looked a little bit different at this point in time. Uh, you can see we've added, okay, I'm gonna give up on this here at some point. Uh, we've added a bunch of radar sensors to the outside for proximity radar. Uh, around the vehicle, but the big thing here is now the rotating uh, chicken bucket that people call it, the 64 beam Velodyne HDL 64. Uh, one of the first ones in the world was sitting on my desk and it's been highly leveraged ever since. And that made all the difference here. Uh, the only other noteworthy thing here is, this is our computer box in the middle here. It was air conditioned, sat on some shock towers. And what ran the vehicle at that time was a whole stack full of uh, server class Xeon computers. This is uh, the uh, start line on the morning of the race. Um, we're the white truck here. You guys uh, from Carnegie Mellon are the Caterpillar here. And Oshkosh down here is obviously the biggest looking truck, but it was quite maneuverable actually. This is a view from the other side and it's uh, even got some signatures on it. Uh, one of the things that uh, most people don't know is we also supported the teams from Virginia Tech and MIT that made it to the finals. And uh, collaboration was pretty important back then and it continues to remain so as people try to solve some of these hard problems to move forward in autonomy. So I think I have a video clip here to show just a little snippet of the car driving at the two uh, DARPA challenges. This is kind of what a uh, typical uh, Mojave Desert Road looked like that we drove down. Typically we drive these about 30 miles an hour. This was a particularly tough challenge because this is a big car compared to, or big truck compared to those cars. We've only got a couple centimeters or a couple inches of clearance on either side to not hit that wall and stay inside the lines. Um, and again that was thanks to uh, the really great sensing we got out of the LiDAR. 
Um, so how did we screw up on the urban challenge? This one's a little more difficult to explain. So if I were to go back to that map where I showed you the city layout, one of the things they had you do in qualifying was they barricade a road and you had to do a U-turn in the road or a K-point turn. Or in the case of our vehicle, K equals uh, 32. <laughs> you guys ever seen the Austin Powers movie where the guy gets his cart stuck in the hallway and he's going like this? Uh, 54 foot diameter, remember? So, so generally what happened when you'd see some sort of false positive in the race, and this is what humans do too, they go, well, does that false positive really mean anything? So like if I'm driving down the road and there's a car in my lane that's not moving, and there's a yellow line to my left, I usually say, well, you know, screw the yellow line, I'm just going to pass that stalled car, right? We don't think much about it. But when you've written lines of code to say, hey, you know, you know thou shalt not cross double yellow lines or things, uh, for us it was a problem to do this 32 point turn on this barricaded road. And to get around these sort of problems, what we'd do is we'd say, well, you know, if you wait a certain amount of time, maybe you might consider not following all the rules. So, you know, you cross that double yellow line, you pass the stalled car. Well, in our case, it was like that curb is nothing to an F-250, let's just go through the neighbor's lawn. <laughs> so, what every programmer knows, or at least one that works on a product, is you never change code the night before you're going to use the code. But nonetheless, we thought, we're going to solve that problem. So we went out in the desert at midnight, and we were solving this problem about how to do this k-point turn, where you know, k was going to be a very large number, and not hit the timeout, where we'd say, you know, screw it, we're going to go through the neighbor's yard and go around the barricade. So we fixed it, but while we were fixing it, we changed that countdown timer from two minutes to 20 minutes. We added a zero, so we'd have plenty of time for testing the code and it not getting invoked. Well, two in the morning, somebody forgot to turn the 20 back to a two. And so the first time we saw a false positive, it's not very easy to see here, but there's a fairly deep rain gutter here. It's uh, deeper than your normal curb. And you can see it lit up as this green line in front of us showing that we've got an in-path curb. And one of the rules says don't drive over curbs. So we sat there at that stop sign and DARPA came out and said, you know, excessive delay at a stop sign. And we opened the door to the vehicle, had a valid route planned, and we're like, ugh, the timer's clicking down from 20 minutes, not two minutes. So um, again, in an offhanded ma manner, the, the size of the vehicle bit us. Um, that and the fact you should never change code, you know, the night before you're going to use the code. Um, so I, I want to touch on this topic a little bit, going again, why did we do this? So how reliable are human drivers? And, and, and this conversation comes up in almost every interview I do. You can go to NHTSA or in, any government's website and find out how many miles the average person drives and how long they live and, you know, such things and find out how many miles they're going to drive in a lifetime. It turns out that the key number I want you to take away from here is there's about 14 and a half fatalities per every billion miles driven. Or to put that in another fashion, it's roughly, you know, ignore the, the round off error here, it's roughly 100 million miles between fatalities. So humans on, on average drive 100 million miles between fatalities. Now you say, wait a minute, you just told me like a lot of you die, right? Well, that's because there's billions of us on the planet and we all drive a lot. And so, you can you know, actually calculate what your probability of fatality is. It's just you know, 1 minus e to the minus alpha x, where alpha is the failures per, per unit distance. And, and you can accurately, just by sticking in these numbers that come out of the database, you can say the probability of dying in a car accident in a lifetime for the average person is about 1%. And that totally agrees with the, the, the other accident statistics. Now, why do I throw that out there? Because I want to compare that to robots. So. Again, I don't want to go through too much arithmetic here, but if we look at instantaneous failures, the probability of failure in a short amount of time is just proportional to that amount of time. So, so the probability of failure is just alpha dx. And, okay, I'm going to give up on the laser pointer unless somebody else has one. Um, but then the probability of success is 1 minus the probability of failure, and you get that that's e to the minus alpha x, where alpha, again, is the, uh, uh, the mean failure rate. And the interesting thing about that is I turned that equation around and I said, okay, let me just apply that to the two DARPA challenges that we did. So um, in this case, success was five of the 23 vehicles finished the second challenge and six of the 11 vehicles finished 
the urban challenge. So if I calculate, you know, what's the sort of mean failure rate at this point in time for robots of this vintage, I got about 0.01. In other words, about 100 miles between failure. And that was exactly what we were more or less measuring when we were testing prior to the race and our stupid screw-ups with the software. But this is an important point. 100 miles between failure. Humans are 100 million. So every time we talk about doing a level 4 autonomous vehicle, you have to, in the back of your mind, realize that in the court of public opinion and in the court of law, you're going to get sued if you don't achieve something that resembles human or better performance and you hand it to a consumer who has the expectation that you're giving them that something is good or better than they are. So we have to close this gap between once in a hundred miles to once in a hundred million miles. So this is why this problem is so daunting. So here's what uh, our test fleet looked like in 2013 and we're still driving these cars. I'll play a little video clip here. It's really boring. So <laughs> autonomous vehicles from a consumer point of view should be consistent, reliable, robust, comfortable, they should be predictable. And so we put people in this car and they're just bored numb. And uh, that's success. Now this is a proving ground right across the street from my office. And I'm just going to skip forward to the, I hope it's the next slide here. I guess maybe I can let this play out, there's only a second left. See if I can fix my laser pointer. Anyway, we don't always drive that way. So sometimes we'll take people around that track, it'll be strewn with obstacles, stalled cars, cars to pass, cars to merge with, pedestrians not to hit, you know, all the normal things. But once in a while when they go, yeah, you know, I've seen that elsewhere, we go, okay, well, well ours goes to 11. And uh, how, many, how many of you are old enough to get that? Um, uh, we'll drive the vehicle to where it gets airborne. So on this track, it gets airborne at 60 miles an hour and or 6 tenths of a G. There's sound with this. You can hear the engine screaming, but the sound doesn't work on my computer here today. So the point of this wasn't just to say we could drive 6 tenths of the G. It was uh, when we were actually working on the uh, longitudinal and lateral control algorithms. but. Uh, so we'd give people a ride on this track, you know, it'd be like grandma, and then we'd take them out here, and you'll see here why it suddenly gets a little nauseating. Um, it's a lot better with the sound because you can hear tires squealing and such, but uh, in any event, um, the vehicle can perform at the operating em envelope of what a human would ever want to do with it. So what does the sensing suite look like on the car today? Looks pretty much like the DARPA car, only everything's gotten a little bit smaller, a little bit cheaper, uh, you know, a little bit less expensive. Uh, our vehicles are typically, in, the, in this generation of fleet, they're typically four LiDAR units on the roof for mapping and localization and obstacle detection. We have a suite of radars under the skin, and we have some machine grade cameras, and that's about it. So how, how do you drive an autonomous vehicle? Pretty much everyone has a notion of this. All, all starts with knowing where you are. That's what we call localization. So you take some combination of your prior knowledge of the world. Maybe you have a map. Maybe you have some other sort of prior information. You take the information coming from your sensors, and you know maybe you're lucky enough to have uh, you know an inertial measurement unit with some gyros and you know wheel speed encoders and stuff. Figure out where you're at, and then you use your sensors to figure out where the other stuff's at. And then you plan a path that doesn't hit that stuff. And then you control the vehicle to you know, drive like you just saw in that previous video. It's pretty simple. So let me show you um, an example of two of the sensing modes. So on the top here, you'll see the rings of the laser scan in the ground. This is just one scan. Uh, this happens you know, 10 times a second. But uh, this is the corresponding camera imagery outside the research building at Ford. If you put the two together, uh, you'll see the individual cameras up here. I didn't stitch them. I've, overlaid the laser strikes with the camera and I've removed those in the ground plane because if I covered the ground plane you couldn't even see the rest of the picture. And then, and then, then the problem is down here, so then you go out driving and so you see the power of sensor fusion, right? Both the camera and the laser agree 
where, where these objects are. These things sticking out of the ground plane that shouldn't be there, they both agree. And if I overlaid the radar and any other sensors, the, the idea is to try to put them all in the same reference frame so that we can get the, the most robust information about tracking the obstacles. So I'm not going to play that video. It won't play on this machine. It's got a bad codec. So I want to talk a little bit about this one. I think I'm maybe even pause it here. This is my favorite video. This is a, it's a big debate right now about whether you need a map to drive autonomously. And I have an opinion on most everything in the world, and I have an opinion on this as well. I, I think as we go forward, you know, the artificial intelligence and uh, some of the machine learning techniques, you know, deep neural nets, will do quite a bit to help us drive in areas that we don't have a lot of prior knowledge. But I make the counter argument that if I'm going to say, you know, go ahead, you put your kids in the car and let them go to school, or, you know, you go ahead and take a nap in your car, I'm not going to put you on that road in a, unless I know that road's traversable. So that means I'm going to drive it once to know that a vehicle can even get down it. And while I'm driving it, I just keep the data. So I keep the data, I keep it like this, it's 3D data, and uh, I make a map out of it. I don't throw it away. Um, I, I just don't quite understand why you want to throw all the data away. So what you're looking at here, it's kind of bright in this room, it's going to be hard to see, but everything above the ground plane I've co colored cyan, and everything in the ground plane is the reflectivity of the road. So that's actually from those laser beams on top of the car, measuring the reflectance in the ground plane. And by the way, that other thing, that was uh, Michigan Stadium that went by. Uh. So anyway, so here's the trick, right? So we've driven it once, we made this fancy map here. So now we come back, and the idea is just to answer the question, where am I in this map? So now I'm going to redrive this thing, and only the live data, I'm going to color it. So now you can see, I just snapped the two to a line. And now I know to within a few centimeters where I am in the world. And any of the stuff sticking out of the ground plane, like these cars here, just don't hit them. And in a nutshell, that's how the vehicle works. It's a gross oversimplification, but Uh, and, and I'm only showing the LiDAR data here. We have corresponding, you know, camera tracks and radar tracks and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But it, not to clutter up the, the problem too much here. Uh, if it were darker in the room here, you could see every crack in the road and every tar strip and, uh, you know, every tiny little feature. It might not seem obvious, but almost every piece of pavement in the world is different at this scale. It's like, you know, your thumb looks like mine, except when we look at the fingerprints, they're really different. Um, and, and that's actually, it's not the only localization algorithm we use, but it's a really, it's a really good one. And uh, when the ground gets covered with snow, we omit the ground plane and then we just localize to the 3D structure above it. Yes, question? So this leads to the obvious question, trees get chopped down, they lose yeah. their leaves, park cars, park trucks, yep. construction. I'll answer that. So I, I didn't put those slides in here, but you know, I made a map in the winter of 2009 and I drove it in the summer of 2011. Winter, summer, snow banks, leaves, right? So your question. Um, roughly 30% of the scene content changed. You can easily reject those as outliers and fit to the inliers. And we- so there's a sinkhole on Craig's- Oh, okay. <laughs> sinkhole, it's about three slides from now, okay? We'll get to that. It literally is. So let me just summarize that again. So we make a map, and everyone's going to disagree about what features they put in their map. But this is just one example, right? Ground plane intensity. And then you and I agree, as a society, we say, hey, we're going to call these things roads that we can drive on. You don't drive on the rest of it, just where we put the green lines. And they have names, you know, and they have some rules, you know, like go only go one way on this one, and, you know, this speed here, and stop there, and your favorite Starbucks is over here. And we just put all the metadata in the map. And then the idea is really, we just come back and we just see one little piece of that puzzle and we go, well, where is it? And we slew it around in the map a little bit. Actually, we don't even go that far. We just go plus or minus about 20 meters and we get a couple centimeters localization lock. So, not to belabor that point, but it's just one of the algorithms that we use to solve that big problem right in the middle of everything. Where am I? Because once you know where you are, then you can segment out the stuff that shouldn't be there and not hit it. So on the not hit it front, I want to talk a little bit about sensing and how that's evolving. How many of you guys, let's show a vote of hands here, how many of you guys sitting at this intersection 
would make that left turn. Yeah, okay, so this car and that car are 100 meters away. So at, at highway speed, they're going about 30 meters a second. They're going to be there in three seconds. You don't clear the intersection. You're going to get T-boned. Takes you about six to 10 seconds, even aggressively, to go from a stop through a left turn up to highway speed. So you better be looking six to 10 seconds on the time horizon for those, uh, those obstacles. And what that really corresponds to is more like these cars and that car. So how big are those cars? So now that gets to the, you know, what resolution you need to look at. So you know, you look out on the horizon, what might it be? It might be a motorcycle. It might only be half a meter wide and a meter tall and it's 200 meters out there. You know, what angle does that subtend on the horizon? So if I don't have that resolution in my sensing, at least one mode that's reliable, I'm not going to see that. And I risk, you know, and this is just one example. I could probably give you dozens of examples like this where your sensing horizon can get to be quite long. And the reason that we're having challenges right now meeting this is because lasers like this one, and it's pretty close to the frequency of the laser on those scanners, your eyeballs can see them and your eyeballs heat up and so we have rules about how much power you can put out there and so now we're trying to put you know that power as efficiently as we can out there and return it similarly for radar people say well why don't you plaster a bunch of radars around the car well you can only put a radar beam plus or minus 10 degrees out to 200 meters you're limited in how much power you can put out if you want to put it 360 degrees around the vehicle the FCC the, you know the Federal Communications Commission says you have to reduce the range. It's the power that they mandate. So if you do 360 radar, you're only going to get to 80 meters. So um, right now you see a lot of startup companies working in these spaces of you know, getting the cutting edge of the sensing technology to be able to get out to these time horizons that you need for some of these difficult driving tasks. Yeah? Probably solving the wrong problem. I mean, in, in the airspace, vehicles and out themselves are collision avoidance. Sure. Once you start sharing data, mm -hmm. cars says, I'm Anyone here. know what the half-life of a car? GPS coordinates, I'm here. Mm -hmm. If data transacted between cars, then you could unburden mm -hmm. this active sensing. Okay. I have three answers for you. The deer don't talk. Um, well, deer is a different issue, but they don't go 60 miles. Okay, away. sure. <laughs> but they do jump out of the woods fast. Uh, um, the the half-life of a vehicle in the United States is 11 years. So if I, if I waved a magic wand and said, Tomorrow, federal government, every new car has DSRC radio. 11 years from now, only 50% of the cars would have it. 22 years from now, you know, it's another half-life. So we're talking like decades and decades. And even if I had an even super fancy magic wand and I said I'm gonna retrofit all the cars today, I don't know that yours is working today. Yours could have gotten busted, you know, the fuse might be blown. So I still have to stand on my own merit. And the answer I always give people is I'll take any data you give me because it'll make the answer more robust, but I can't rely on it always being there. I have to stand on my own merit. So yeah, we'd love DSRC, you know, we'd love all that stuff. They're not talking yet. So right now our cars are driving in these scenarios and you know, we're managing to get by. It's, it could be more robust and that goes back to this question, can you meet human performance of 10 to the eighth miles between Fatality, right? So that's part of the, it's part of the answer, but in and of itself, um, this slide I just threw in here to show, this just doesn't happen on rural roads, it happens, you know, this is right near our office in Palo Alto, you know, they have these little stoplights in California, you got to wait and get on the freeway and you're waiting here and you got to go from zero to 80 miles an hour and like these things can occur at any angle, any weird angle. So you really do need 360 degree sensing. These people are thinking you can put a sensor out the front. Well, they're obviously not going to drive anywhere with a merge ramp or two roads across each other at anything but, you know, 90 degrees. So, let me jump, jump ahead. This is a car that we're developing on right now. It's also a fusion platform, but um, this one was production. This one has um, what I would call is moving in the direction of airliners. So, we'll have like dual CAN buses, dual electrical systems, uh, dual uh, E-pass uh, steering racks, dual brake systems. Can't have any single point of failure. Right now, if you're driving the car and the power steering goes out, you as the human can still steer it, you know, you're the backup. If you're a level four autonomous vehicle, you have no backup. So the platform of this vehicle is designed to have no single point of failure. 
And you see, see the progression from the, you know, the 29 pound laser down to, uh, you know, these are probably three or four pounds and these are now, you know, like hockey puck size. And um, it's a continuous progression. I'll just skip these slides here. Um, I threw this slide in here to, to switch topics. So uh, the slide doesn't really mean much. Uh, so I, I basically kind of talked a little bit about the DARPA challenge and why we got into driving autonomously and sort of where Ford's at and some of the algorithms and sensing challenges out there. So a lot of you have read in the news and I'm sure you've got to all know it, you're here in Pittsburgh. Um, we joined together with this subsidiary company that uh, we helped form called Argo.ai. How many of you have heard of Argo.ai? And we basically had announced that in 2021 uh, we'll have a commercial product doing level four autonomy. And it's a very defined uh, mission goal. It'll likely be a, uh, a fleet service doing uh, ride share or package delivery, something where the vehicles go out and back every day. They can be serviced and calibrated and the route's well understood. Uh, that's the kind of thing you can expect in that time frame. And you can't expect everything in 2021. The media doesn't seem to understand that. And uh, so uh, the, the sole focus of Argo.ai is to take the experience of the guys that, that formed the company and the funding and the experience. They, they robbed most of my team uh, from Ford. Or, well, it's a partnership. Uh, is to take their experience, our experience at Ford, and get out from the bureaucracy of a major corporation and go off and just you know, hammer on making that first production product feasible in that time frame. So that's a, bless met, a, a mixed blessing and curse for me. Uh, I'm no longer on the hook for you know, meeting production deadlines. I, I don't like, I'm not a product guy, I'm a research guy. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I don't get to every day go out there and say, geez, you know, I'd kind of do it this way versus that way. Um, but, but what I'm doing now is, um, We've taken all the people in research that didn't go off with the Argo Endeavor and started to look at the broader mobility picture. Um, it's not just self-driving cars that we're interested in in the mobility space, and it's not just these limited use cases like driving 25 miles an hour around in a ride share. So uh, a couple examples here that are just immediately obvious. I'm not going to go into all of them. How do you drive in uh, you know, bad weather, right? That's out of scope in the next few years. You know, you're not gonna drive in, in uh, you know, really heavy snow or rain. Um, you're not gonna drive really complex topologies like this. Um, you're not gonna drive at Audubon speed and pick up road debris. I'm gonna show you some slides about road debris. Um, and then there's some, like I said, I just pulled these slides randomly. Uh, so this would uh, be, I'm gonna show you some road debris on a road like this. But I, I want to vote here. Which one of these roads do you guys think is the harder to drive? How many of you pick uh, California? How many of you pick the Bolivian Death Road? <laughs> I've driven both of them. This one's trivial to drive. For a robot, there's a huge discontinuity. There's negative infinity there and positive infinity there. And there's only one flat spot. <laughs> there's only one lane. There's not much decision making there. That's trivial. This road, on the other hand, is the most dangerous road in the United States. It's the boring section of road between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and most of the road has virtually no shoulder and very loose gravel. If you put a tire there, you're going to roll the vehicle and it's almost certain death. I've seen it in person. Uh, so, the kind of the point of this slide, it's kind of a legacy slide in my slide deck, is the news people and uh, you know, sort of the public perception very, very often handicaps the easy and the hard problems in reverse, reverse order. And, uh, and it's easy to see why they do so. So, speaking of road debris, <laughs> I often ask people, you know, there's a lot of weird things that can happen to you in a lifetime of driving. <laughs> and if I went around the room here and asked each of you what's the weirdest one that happened to you, it wouldn't be the same as me. So this is one of the challenges with getting to the 10 to the 8th miles reliability. So how do you understand all these weird things that can happen? Right? Well, for me, one of the stories I tell is I was actually driving behind a horse trailer and the prize horses fell through the bottom when it rusted out. They got ground into chunks and thrown on the hood of my car. So that's why I have this picture here. I don't have a horse getting flown through the air. But you say, you know, this is pretty rare. 
but you go to Google, and what do you know? <laughs> There's more of them. And for any of these problems that you think of, so you can just go to Google Images and think of any weird thing that you say will never happen, and you can find pages of them. So here's another one, pull through windshield. That's a Google search. Um, so I find this one here to be pretty insidious. Uh, and this goes back to the sensing set. So in a camera image, you have no idea if that's a, you know, imagine before it got to you, you really have no idea how big that log is, right? I mean, the camera's a two-dimensional imager. And a radar sees right through wood. It's transparent to radar. So if you don't have a LiDAR system on your car that can resolve something of that size, you're never going to see that pole coming out of your head. And these poles can be any size, and, and literally, I'm telling you, you can go through pages and pages and pages and pages on Google Images and find scene after scene like this, where people, you know, they, they fail to realize that things are sticking out the back of vehicles. And, and for every one of these scenarios, and there's, trust me, I've watched tons of Russian dash cam videos, and uh, you, you can find amazingly weird things, there's just a couple of them here, that are challenging. So now, like that one, I can hit. So why can I hit that one, but not that one? So, okay, so now here's where cameras come in, right? Because the you know, camera kind of can maybe classify that as something, yeah, not so good. That one, you can ignore. So each of these sensors has you know, some strengths and weaknesses. Um, surprisingly, there's about a million mattresses flying off of cars. Uh, you can find uh, just literally hundreds of videos of them whizzing by things. This guy on the motorcycle had to do some fancy slalom turns to get around that. I don't know where that hatchet came from, but uh, there's your sinkhole. And this, this one's a pretty difficult problem in general. Any, any negative obstacle in the road is basically a line of sight issue. And to some extent, the first car is going to be the probe vehicle and report it back to the cloud for all the other cars. Um, that's a fairly intractable problem at the moment. I throw this one in here because this is our friend's Tesla um, in their auto park. It illustrates what happens with today's radar. So people always say, well, you know, why do you use LiDAR? Just you just spray some radar out there. Well, radar doesn't have any vertical discrimination. So uh, it basically goes out to a very you know, narrow field of view in the vertical plane. And uh, so you, you really need to put all these sensors together. So let me just close with a, a few slides here about some of the broader scope things that we're doing uh, in the research lab right now. So we've renamed, uh, you know, after we've uh, shed this uh, first launch and, and let Argo assume responsibility for it, we've renamed our departments the Robotics and AI Department. And uh, we're thinking about uh, transportation and uh, mobility and robotics in a broader sense. And so that could include things like moving into three dimensions. And so you can imagine, you know, package delivery this way, because you know, you have that truck that Argo made that drives to somebody's address, but somehow you got to get the package from the truck to the front door. Or, you know, there's that last little 100 meter problem. Uh, there's also a bunch of people out there rethinking uh, now that electric batteries, or, or now that batteries make electric propulsion feasible for flying aircraft, they're thinking of four seat uh, drones like this that can do vertical takeoff and landing. These wings rotate. So it just lifts straight up and then turns into a cruise flight at 200 knots. So now suddenly if you're in the Bay Area and it takes you uh, two hours to go from San Francisco to you know, your office in Cupertino where you work at Apple or something, you can be there in five minutes. Um, so there's a whole bunch of business models around thinking about adding these. So you can imagine your autonomous vehicle takes you from your garage over to you know, where the nearest one of these little helipads are you know, a mile from your house and you hop in that and whisk off to the inner city or you know, maybe to the, the Steelers game or you know, whoever your favorite sports team is. Um, there's also a lot of, that can be done in the world of personal mobility and assistance devices. You know, obvious ones out there are things like the Segway. We've all seen variants of this. Uh, this is a popular one for uh, you know, not just uh, models in high heel shoes, but elderly people who want to get their groceries you know, through the mall uh, or the shopping store. Um, you know, I saw somebody in the elevator today on one, something like this. You have people working on uh, robotic prosthetics to help, uh, you know, elderly. A uh, whole bunch of work's going on on bipedal robots. You can imagine this thing could be your, the last 100 meter power problem to get your package 
from uh, the end of the driveway to the doorstep because not uh, every driveway allows you to walk, right? There might be some stairs involved or uh, some cobblestones or something. Or I mean, not every driveway allows you to roll like this. So, um, And then uh, another thing that's become popular just only recently is rethinking uh, actually how we make everything in this country and in the world and just uh, making all the factories you know, completely robotic. Never used to be sexy to do, you know, ro factory robotics, but but now people are thinking, you know, I don't know, do we do it this way or do we just create some humanoids that, uh, you know, can can do it? Uh, so there's all these new ideas that are opening up where you use the same techniques you use in autonomous vehicles, right? You got to know where you are, you got to localize, you got to sense the world around you in 3D, and you got to take some control action to get through it without hitting the stuff. And so pretty much uh, at, at the core, a lot of the key elements are the same. And uh, that's where we're moving in the future at uh, Ford, uh, generally broadening the scope of robotics and artificial intelligence to not only include the driving cars, but other things. And I think I've way extended uh, my stay here, and I'll uh, take as many questions as you guys want to answer, or want to have answered. Yes. It occurs to me I failed to show you the most boring video of all because it won't play in here. I'll play that in the background while we, um, while we answer questions. If I can open this file. You know, it sucks when you get old and you got to pull out your reading glasses to see the file names. Um, So we had this question at one point in time, could we make a large scale map using that intensity, the ground plane intensity that I showed you? So we drove this route in California, well basically it's kind of more or less from Phoenix to Palm Springs and back. Uh, and I'm probably missing the play bar at the bottom here, right? Yeah, okay. I'll just let this play in the background. This is a time lapse of what it looks like to drive on the freeway. It's totally boring, except for me eating Cheetos. Um, but that's how it should be. Okay, questions? So this is a political question. Go for it. Okay. I'm not in front of the news media. I can be a little bit more upfront. In the 1980s, I went around to yeah. all the various car companies, including Ford, and I was selling the idea that neural networks, which was a thing then, should be used in cars. Oh, so that's Fuzzy Logic uh, Part 2. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I was told there is no possible way they would ever do anything like this because the lawyers would let them. The perennial question was, who do you sue you know, if they so go wrong? So you actually hit on one of the sore points that I like to harp about a lot. So, you know, the pendulum swings. Uh, right now the flavor of the day is deep neural nets and, uh, and uh, deep learning of all sorts. Uh, I think it's great for some problems like classification, uh, I don't see any reason why you use such a thing to learn what the speed limit is because uh, you know it's posted on the road or, or what the name of the street is. It's in the map database or, or how you run the control algorithm on the engine of your car. You know, I mean we understand those things. There's mathematical equations for them. So in my world I see a mix of properly using uh, you know artificial intelligence, you know DNNs with uh, rule-based logic. Uh, other people disagree with me. They say, you know, just stick a camera into an NVIDIA card and let it turn the steering wheel however, you know, a hundred million drivers did. And I kind of question whether you're going to get the New York City taxi cab driver from that model or you're going to get a good driver. Um, but there's another problem with it that you bring up. It's the traceability. So. When you write rule-based logic and equations, and as a physics guy, I'd like to ever have everything be just a simple equation. Um, it's pretty easy to debug what you've done and understand where things went right and where they went wrong. Uh, it's a lot more difficult with uh, any sort of uh, deep net, and that's that's an issue. It really is. Uh, um, how you? How is it self-driving cars are going to happen in a few years? I, what change? Well, everything you're seeing here is completely rule-based at the moment. Um, so we're just now adding to some of these scenarios, particularly the, the things that you do need to classify. And 
I'm also of the belief that people worry too much about classifying things that they don't have to. If I'm driving down the street and you're having coffee at the cafe on the side of the street, I don't really need to know that because your mo momentum vector is never going to be in the street. You know, so there's, there's this tool that people like to use and they want to classify everything under the sun. If it's sticking out of the ground plane where I know you and I have agreed is a road, uh, I just don't want to hit it at the, at the in lowest order. At a higher order, there are different rules for things like a FedEx truck and a school bus, right? They might look the same size and shape, uh, but the school bus, you know, you can't pass it when the kids are getting off. And, uh, so you do know, need to know some things and classify some. Do you need to classify and learn everything? I, I tend to think not, but I might be ruled wrong by history. Yeah. So, somewhat related, curious how are you planning or what is the, uh, the path that you're going to get to a uh, uh, product verification and validation? In other words, mm -hmm. how, with, with all the diversity mm -hmm. of cases, yeah, how so is your PBMB team going to approach this and come back with an answer that, yep, we're good? So, that's what Argo is about. Uh, <laughs> I get to go back to research now, but to answer that question a little bit more honestly, uh, we data log everything we do. So terabytes of data an hour come off this vehicle. And anytime we make an algorithm change, we can play it against all the previous data logs to see if things got better or worse. We can use learning networks on the prior data. Um, and you can make generalizations, right? That horse meat that got thrown on the front of my car, I didn't really need to know that that was horse meat, right? It was just debris. It was debris of a certain size and you know, volumetric size. It had a different momentum vector than me. I can make a decision in a general sense about what I should do about debris. So lots of verification and validation, you know, lots of replaying against previous data, lots of acquiring data and re-simulating it. Um, you know, a lot of work goes into it. And I should also mention things like that are more mundane to guys like us is, you know, like the ISO 26262 requirements and, you know, uh, systems engineering and uh, failure, failure modes analysis and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Right. Oh, oh go ahead. No, just I'll stay as long as you guys want. Uh, real quick, so uh, are you setting to, to have a standard set of uh, uh, conditions or, or cases? So this is the industry that's, that's converting to help out, help out a bit? This is another difficult question because a lot of states want to jump in and say, well, you know, if you pass our driving test, you know, we'll give you a thumbs up. And, but we don't want, you know, 50 states to have 50 different driving tests. That doesn't make sense. So NHTSA has stepped up to start to uh, write some sensible rules about minimum sort of requirements and testing. Not at the level of detail of telling you what specifically to do, but at the larger scale of saying what the performance at the endpoint should be. You, you know, you, like you should not hit pedestrians. They're not going to tell you how not to hit the pedestrian, for example. Okay, I had a question over here. Uh, when a car wreck happens, how fast is it going to be? I'm sorry, are people moving. When a car wreck happens, how fast what? So, what was when, the when, okay, so I, if I understand it right, when a car wreck happens, how fast am I going <clears> to <throat> respond to it in front of me? So, one of the things that humans do, let me get rid of this distraction here. You saw how boring the freeway driving was. Um, so, one of the things that humans do is they tailgate. And we violate, yeah, thank you, Windows, close the program. Um, we, uh, we violate all sorts of rules, tailgating being one of them. So if, if, you're, if you're a robot, you can say, you know, I, I know what the deceleration capabilities of my vehicle is. I know the stopping distance. Don't get closer to anything in front of me than the stopping distance. So theoretically, you should never be in that situation. Now, if you do, what ends up happening in the reality out on the road is people get pissed at you and they start leapfrogging you because they want to tailgate. And so you have to play this game with fitting in with society and, and you know, fitting in with giving a guaranteed safe path. Now we, we all do it every day. Um, you know, we all crest a hill and we don't know what's over the far side. You know, we, we pull out when we don't have line of sight. There's just a million examples I can give you. You couldn't get home without taking some leaps of faith. But generally, in, when we're out on the freeway driving, we don't get in those scenarios. We, we always leave a gap that we can decelerate to, to zero um, at a comfortable 
pace, uh, or you know, without you know fully locking up the brakes, something that a human would find comfortable. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're doing with the ground? It seems too simple just to put a plane to it. Uh, the, the ground plane in yeah. the in that map. Uh, yes. Okay, so we have probably at least half a dozen localization algorithms. And in that one, we're simply looking at the reflectivity of the road at the wavelength of the laser. And uh, the laser will give you range, elevation, and azimuth, and you can back out you know, what the height of the ground plane was uh, you know, based on that. And, and we, uh, we tile, in, in that particular map, it's tiled into 10 centimeter tiles. We search about 20 meters around the vehicle, we get a pretty good lock. I don't know how much more granularity you want me to talk about it on. It's not as simple as I'm saying, okay, because there's actually four lidars on the car, each with 32 beams. So there's now 128 beams sweep in the ground, and they're all hitting at a different angle of incidence from a different direction. So we have to backward reconstruct where they came from, make sure they all observe the same piece of ground with the same intensity. So we have to correct for the, you know, the spot size and the angle of incidence and all of that kind of stuff goes into the nitty gritty details and some thresholding on, you know, on the noise and things like that. But essentially we're just taking a black and white photograph of the ground at 905 nanometers. But when you're driving over it, why consider it a plane? We don't, we don't, we don't consider it a plane. I, I, I just generically say ground plane to mean the, the road, right? I mean, it's not a plane, right? There's ripples in it and we see ruts and, uh, and features and yeah, we see hills and yeah. It, and in fact, if I had more time here, I'd show you how we fit to three dimensions and, and we have some very interesting algorithms for seeing things like, uh, you know, wires overhead and uh, tree canopies and, you know, stop signals. Um, it just turns out that that's the simplest algorithm to, to run robustly. It's not the only one we run. Yeah. yeah so, um, do you think at the end of the day, L5 for, for L5 self-driving, HD map would be like a must for that for, for self-driving? So, I kind of mentioned this earlier. I, there's a debate out there about how much you can do with learning and how much prior knowledge of the world you need. And I cannot predict how fast computational power and sensing capability will get you to the point where you have less reliance on that. I can only make the argument that I'm going to drive those roads before I let you drive them taking a nap. And as long as I'm driving them, I'm going to exploit the data and make a map. It costs me nothing. So, you know, can we make the, the maps what people will call lighter weight, you know, less data intensive? Yeah, hi highly likely. Um, how fast we'll do that, I don't know. It, maybe some, some stretches of road. Uh, the, like in an inner city like this, there's lots of features, right? Corners of buildings, things that you can just extract a few features from and know where you're at. If you're on a, a road, say in uh, Iowa or Nebraska or Nevada, where there's no features whatsoever, it's just corn, 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 and road, the only features you have are the paint lines on the road and the cracks and things like that. That's the only features. This is the ground plane itself. You're not going to find any above ground features to, to you know, to, to put uh, in a different feature space that's not as intense as a intensity map. When are we going to get fully autonomous Formula One racing? <laughs> that would actually be probably easier in some aspects than driving on the, on the road, right? Because there's the... Well, you know, everyone's following the same rules. All the cars have the same sort of performance. Uh, um, you'd have to up the, uh, you know, the refresh rate on the sensors. Right now, most of our sensors run at 10 or 20 hertz, uh, which kind of limits how close you can get to the vehicle in front of you. Because at that speed, you know, it takes a finite amount of time to close the brake calipers and accelerate and stuff. So, you know, you need faster sensing and uh, mechanics, uh, mechanicals on the car, but. I think it's totally possible right now. Especially if you have the V to V, right? Like if the race cars are talking to each other, then it's, uh, it's probably a containable problem. You got these big barricaded walls too, so you know, you can hit stuff. <laughs> yes? So what kind of requirements do you see for LiDAR in 2021? And what technology your company do you think is going to get us there? So if you go back two years, Literally, the only company in the world, unless you built it yourself, that was offering LiDAR that was suitable for these test vehicles was Velodyne. If you look in the marketplace now, there's probably two dozen or more of them. And 
There are some interesting ideas out there, but ultimately it all comes back to traffic and scenarios that I need to pay attention to can happen 360 degrees around the vehicle. Likewise, if you're in a city like San Francisco or Pittsburgh, you know, you can have roads with discontinuities in the, the, the road grade, right? So imagine a uh, road comes down like this, crosses the intersection, goes down like that, you know, San Francisco. I not only have to look this way, but I, you know, I have to look up, up at whatever, you know, that road grade is. So you need to expand the field of view that you're looking at. Right, right now the lidars, we don't have enough beams to afford to throw them away. And, um, the Velodyne's next product is a 128 beam, uh, 360 degree LiDAR. There are other people out there doing similar things by taking single beams and rastering them around with mirrors or phased arrays or things like that. Uh, I think it's too early right now to determine who's going to win out in the end. Um, on, on the one hand, the rotating units, they do see 360 degrees. Um, People will argue it rotates, you know, it's moving, but you know, the wheels kind of rotate on the car as well and pistons go up and down and I don't know, they don't seem to fail. Uh, the solid state units, people call them solid state, but they're all really made out of a solid, so that's kind of a misnomer too. Uh, but the solid state units typically have 50 degree field of views at best. So you're talking about, you know, maybe putting eight or 12 of them around the car to do the same thing that one Velodyne would do. And uh, yes, they're package smaller, um, but you got to multiplex a whole bunch of them together and you know, I, I don't know where that's going to come out in the wash. And, and I should point out the reason it's really challenging to get out to that 200 meters is, is the eye safety requirements. <coughs> if you move out to the mid-infrared at 1550 nanometers, you can put a laser beam as far out as you want, but then you move to a different semiconductor. You're out in indium gallium arsenide and things get expensive, so can people drive down that semiconductor cost to be similar to you know, silicon or <laughs> AI at work here, yeah. So I don't know. It's it's a it, it, the marketplace is still open there, as it, as it is for 3D imaging radar and you know uh, better cameras. The sensors can be improved across the board. Yes. So these days, everyone who's anyone has autonomous car vision or autonomous cars company. How is that going to pan out over the next ten years? And after the ten years, how is the money going to be? <laughs> Alright, so if I went back, I think these things came out 10 years ago, right? Yep. If 10 years ago you said everyone would be walking around looking at tablets like this, I wouldn't have believed you, right? I'm not going to really be able to predict very well 10 years out. I, I think what you're going to see is in some of these fronts, people are going to work together to solve some of the hard problems because some of those problems are going to involve a lot of data. And so there might be some data sharing. Um, you might get some groups coalesce and work together. Um, obviously not everyone's going to have the, the financial and intellectual wherewithal to get a product to market. Um, who knows what's going to happen with the economy, you know, the federal regulations, the regulations in China, or, you know, they, they don't want you to look at anything with a sensor in China, right? Um, Europe. There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of questions out there. It's really hard to predict. Um, I think though that the first movers do have a big advantage because they get people into the vehicles, they get them to build confidence and uh, um, so there is, there is quite a race on to be among the first. Who hasn't? Uh, okay. Do you expect the government to indemnify uh, no. car companies? No. No. Some of the car companies, I believe including GM, have said we're going to accept all responsibility. Well, I don't know if GM said it. I know Volvo said it in press. Uh, I, I don't read every press clipping out there. Um, by saying no, I'm not saying that that won't happen. I just, you know, I haven't seen them indemnify, uh, you know, Boeing or, you know, things that fall out of the sky or, you know, all sorts of, you know, other things. So well, they identify a lot of stuff. I don't know. It's a speculative question, right? And. Uh, the, the carrot in all of this though, you can go back to this, the carrot in all of this is a million people a year die worldwide in car accidents. And we, we can put an end to that. Can't get rid of all of them, but a lot of them. So we'll see how, how much regulation pushes um, to, to help us along with this problem. Yeah. Uh, are these autonomous cars going to be able to change models between like driving, like the driver driving? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, you know, 
a lot of people come to the conclusion that by doing this we want to take driving away from people. I love to drive, a lot of people love to drive, and so when we get past these early you know, commercial fleet operations and we get into personal ownership models, my vision for the way the autonomous vehicle works is just like cruise control today, right? When you like driving, you drive. When you don't, you just push the on button and you let the car drive. So, uh, and, and maybe you, you can choose modes, right? Maybe you want to do that six-tenths of a G driving or maybe you want to do the grandma-like driving. It's, it's all programmable. So, um, yeah, we don't plan on taking the driving experience away from people. And when you switch between modes, maybe you'll learn something about your better driving. Maybe, yes. I'll take a couple more questions here because I don't want to trap people in the room that want to leave. Yes? You didn't say anything about trucking. So there's uh, other companies that are going yeah. to do autonomous uh, trucks. I did. There was a slide in there. I skipped through it really quickly. Like, you know, what are other things people might want to do with their cars? Uh, I had a whole bunch of really cute videos. Uh, one of them was platooning of trucks. Um, that certainly is a business model, and you'll see that being developed. Uh, plenty of people working on that right now. There was a project in Europe, concluded maybe two or three years ago, called Sartre, Safe uh, Autonomous Road Trains for Europe, where uh, uh, Volvo and a bunch of other companies demonstrated a, a string of vehicles platooning on, the, on the, their equivalent of interstates in, I don't know, three or four of the EU countries. But when you go on the Argo AI partnership that you have, that's not going to trucks, so or is that no, presently we're looking at fleet services in, in urban areas. I, I think that's a fair assessment of what you're going to see from anyone who's telling you the truth through the industry. You know, that's kind of where Waymo's heading, where Uber's heading. Uh, you know, a lot of people are heading for that same space because they know they can't do everything at once and so they're going to geofence the operation into areas that they understand well and can cont contain. Yes? So if, if autonomous cars save 500,000 people a year, that's still probably going to be unacceptable to most people because they're still killing 500,000 people? Well, I mean, not necessarily. Well, if they're twice as good, say. Oh, so but you're making, okay, so you're making the assumption everyone's going to be driving them with the autonomous turned on all the time. So the, you don't know where the problem can come from, right? Like if I'm driving and someone in, in an intersection violates a red light and T-bones me, you know, I might have had the right of way and I might not have even seen them, right? Like, say I'm in the car here and there's this tractor trailer next to me in the lane, we're both waiting to go through the, the intersection. I can't see the oncoming cars, you know, and the light turns green, I go and boom, I get T-boned, right? This is where the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications really helps, is, uh, where you don't have line of sight uh, viewing. Uh, you, sure, but isn't there kind of a public perception well, certainly, yeah, and I'm quite surprised, to be honest with you, that there wasn't more backlash after the few Tesla accidents. Um, in addition to the one in Florida, there was a really, really terrible one in China. It actually predated the Florida one. So, yeah, that's the question. Uh, let me give you an analogy here that I find helpful. We introduced uh, anti-lock brakes on cars and airbags on cars. And both of those had really negative public perception, right? People were like, I don't want any damn computer pumping the brakes on my car, and I don't want an airbag blowing up in my face and I can't see to steer, I'm gonna go in the ditch. Well, as soon as people learned that those anti-lock brakes helped them stop on ice and that the airbags were saving you know, lives and serious injuries, we got sued for it not being standard equipment in the passenger seat. And then it got mandated by the federal government. So now all cars have anti-lock brakes, uh, you know, some sort of roll stability control and airbags. And so the bottom line is that uh, you know, people have to get used to the technology. And then when the data comes back and, and sort of speaks for itself, then, uh, then you get a, a lot more leverage on the public perception. What about the state of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication? Is it just within one vendor, or it's there no? Are it's standards? there are standards. Uh, the most common one, something known as DSRC. Um, there's been more than one iteration of what that acronym stands for, but typically it's dedicated short-range radio communications. Um, transmit basically your location and your heading and your mass of the vehicle. A very limited amount of data about 100 meters to the cars around you. That standard's been under works for more than two decades, and they keep saying that next quarter, next quarter, next quarter, Congress is gonna act on it. Never seems to happen. 
Uh, it may eventually happen, but it's kind of a moot point at this juncture in time because you've got things like 5G and LTE and other, other communication standards that may have already leapfrogged that standard. Now, that doesn't mean you don't still have the ability to do uh, wireless communication. It just might not be the DSRC that was proposed 20 years ago. Um, we'll see where that goes. I, I don't know. Um, as I said earlier, we do have to you know, stand on our own merit and be able to drive without it. Thank you all of you for uh, your interest in the project and, and attending today.